start the recording whenever. Thank you. All right. So to start us off with a land acknowledgement, Open Democracy works on Indakina, which are the unceded homelands of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. Um, so we're all here in New Hampshire now, except for the, the person who's joining us from Ohio. Um, so we're all in New Hampshire working on Indakina. And we acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land, the water, and the people who have stewarded in Dakina through generations and continue to do so today. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. And um, Olivia, oh, well, today uh, we're gonna cover what happens prior to election day and election day on election day and post-election day for election monitors. And we can go one more slide. So the objective, um, as a nonpartisan election monitor is to ensure an equal voice for all. So we're hoping to ensure that all eligible voters are able to vote with no barriers, all are able to, all properly cast votes are counted, and um, that no voter should have to choose between their health and their right to vote. And I'll kick it over to Olivia, unless you want me to take this one. Um, nope. Um, I'm Olivia Zink, the executive director at Open Democracy, and we are a state-based um, organization in New Hampshire. Um, our organization was founded by Granny D, who walked across the country for campaign finance reform. So we're uh, excited to work closely with Common Cause and the Election Protection Coalition. Um, and I will say that prior to Election Day, it's really important to do some um, social media monitoring. And this can be done from outside of New Hampshire. Um, so our primary is on Tuesday the 13th. And so we're really looking for people to monitor their local papers um, and their TV to see if they see anything that has incorrect polling places, polling hours, um, or anything that tells people to vote on Monday or Wednesday. Like we know election day is Tuesday, but we wanted to, you know, we have seen um, other uh, efforts that sort of gave the wrong date. Um, we really want to make sure that um, we are inoculating against any kind of content that's bad, uh, misinformation and posting positive, reliable sources. So the Secretary of State has some good posts, um, League of Women Voters or the Open Democracy Facebook, please boost any of our content about election day, the primary day on Tuesday. Um, we all, uh, for those who are reporting misinformation and disinformation through the Common Cause program, we're using the Junkopedia platform to report that um, misinformation and disinformation. And if you missed our uh, training on how to be a social media monitoring, it's linked here and we'll send it out in the slide so you can watch that whole presentation around, you know, what to do, what is misinformation, what do I do when I see it? And how do I flag this? Um, um, there's tonight we're going to cover some of the election rules, um, and there's a lot of election rules. There's a 450-page book. Uh, no one needs to be an expert in all of these rules. I've read the book several times. I still am not an expert. Um, so we're all learning this together on the rules. But I think it is important for us to know. <laughs> Um, the laws that govern elections as we're being election monitoring. Um, so there's a link um, to the Secretary of State's website that just goes through the laws and what's supposed to happen on election day. Um, and it's good to just sort of peruse that. Um, and what I say is the manual, the election procedural manual, which is a big, chunky, big, heavy document um, that us election workers have. So we know what those um, rules are. So if anyone has specific questions and wants to get into the weeds around um, New Hampshire rules, um, please chime in, and ask those questions. And if I don't have the answer, I'll find out and get back to you. Um, so we're going to kind of cover about what it is to be an observer inside the polling place. Um, this is my polling place. So, uh, you know, you see your A through G line and you see Janet handing people the ballots behind. Um, so because this is a picture of my polling place, I'm very familiar with. Um, so everybody has the right uh, to um, have a safe um, vote. 
and you can observe voter registration. Um, the observers that are observing voter registration have to be at least five feet. So you can't hear somebody's date of birth or address. Um, but, um, and you also can observe um, people who are checking in. Um, when people, when the election worker at the check-in table announces the name, um, they're supposed to announce the address. So um, somebody will give, you know, will hold up their ID. If it's me, I'll see Olivia Zink, and then I'll repeat the address and they'll confirm that they still live at that address. Um, you're supposed to have that, the state law requires that to be loud enough for observers to hear that. Um, and also observers are, there's a guardrail where, where people are going in to vote, um, where the curtain is. Observers can't go beyond that guardrail or rail um, per state law, and I've cited the state law there. But you should be able to see the ballot box and the voting booth from inside that guardrail. Um, some monitor, uh, some moderators will ask observers to kind of sit in a certain observer space. Um, but if you do need to get closer to hear or see things, um, you can ask the moderator. But I wanted people to have the um, links to those um, state laws around uh, the how far away you are allowed to be. Um, during COVID in 2020, um, the moderators did kind of create some social dis distancing rules uh, and each moderator is allowed to create those rules for their polling place. So if they do ask for six feet, even though the state law says five feet, they ask you to be six feet away. I, I, I think that they're just trying to do that to create uh, distancing and spacing. So we will see. I. I don't think any of the mandatory COVID rules are in effect and each moderator will run their polling place accordingly. Um, when you're inside um, monitoring the polling place, um, you should see if voters are being denied for voter registration. So I'm gonna tell you a story the last time, one of our poll, monitor, poll monitors saw somebody being turned away for voter registration. And they said, well, I have to go home and I have to get my birth certificate. And um, the poll, poll observer said, did they offer you an affidavit to sign for your date of birth? And they said, no, an, off an affidavit wasn't assigned. And they said, well, you can either go home and get your paperwork or you can go back into the polling place and ask for an affidavit um, and sign it um, to prove to prove your identity. Um, voters should not be um, denied registration due to any racial, gender, or other discrimination. I think this is very common sense, um, but we did see um, a polling place in New Hampshire um, kind of have one, um, one person that was denied uh, registration last time and ended up going, getting their dad and coming back. So we ended up getting them back to the polling place, but it was, um, so we ended, they ended up not getting fully denied, but these are things to be watching for, um, especially if you're in a polling, if you're observing a polling place with more minority communities. Um, some of our polling places um, don't, don't have this issue. Um, and then, um, Watch out for excessive challengers by other observers. We have seen on social media an uptick in people going to the polls and they're saying, oh, I'm gonna challenge every voter. Um, if you see somebody who's doing excessive challenges, we'll wanna notify the attorney general about that. Um, and then also, um, I'm not sure, I know two years ago they were wiping down um, booths and other surfaces to try to keep the polling place clean. Um, so, you know, making sure that it feels safe and healthy for, for voters to be inside, I think is the important thing for us to be looking for when we're observing. Um, as I talked about affidavits, um, this is a challenge voter affidavit. So a voter could challenge um, somebody who is registering to vote. 
I will say that if you are use if you are challenging or you see people challenging, they have to, if they're challenged someone and says, I challenge that this person doesn't live here, they're supposed to provide proof. And then the voter says, I do live here and here's my ID, the, the moderator will allow that person to vote. I will say that if you challenge a voter and you're wrong, there is a penalty for challenging voters uh, willy nilly and you, and you could serve jail time. So people need to be challenging a voter is a, is a pretty big deal. Um, and you definitely wanna have proof that that person doesn't live there. Um, and um, the attorney general will follow up with these documents if, if challenges um, are issued. But if somebody really, really knows like, oh, that was my neighbor and they moved out of town, they shouldn't be back voting. Like there's, this is the affidavit that you could do to challenge a voter. Um, this is used very infrequently in New Hampshire elections. Um, people who are asserting the challenge also has to fill out a form. This is the form that they have to. There are, uh, you see there's grounds for the challenge. So, you know, somebody could say, this person's not 18 years old. This person's not a citizen. There are specific grounds for you to challenge and the person asserting the challenge does have to, um, to fill out a document again and could be hold, held accountable if they're challenging without um, proof. Um, and the challengers um, may be appointed by political committees. So um, a Republican party or a Democratic party can um, appoint a challenger, but I think any vote voter in the polling place is also allowed to exert a challenge. Um, so that, uh, that form was little, very, very little. Um, so I just sort of blew up the allowable challenges. Um, again, a person not being a citizen a person not living in the ward um, or not being, um, you know, doesn't um, live at the address are kind of the more higher chances of, of challenging, but somebody could be challenged if they don't believe they're 18 years old, but they should be voting if they're not 18 years old. Um, so, um, or the person, you know, there's so an allowable challenge is um, a person um, seeking to vote, um, not with the name. So, I mean, I think that this sometimes happens where there's a maiden name on the on the, the list and somebody's married now. Um, in many of those cases, they can rectify by re-registering with their current name. Um, and um, many times the person exerting the challenge um, um, another one is, is if you know somebody is a convicted felon, you can challenge them. So those are the allowable reasons that anyone can challenge a voter. So we also want to talk about what you might observe from outside the polls. Um, and I have both the Secretary of State's number and the Attorney General's number here. Um, these are contact numbers when you're observing that you'll want to put in your um, location. Um, you'll want to bring a pen and paper to sort of jot down notes, maybe uh, your phone with a camera or a camera. And if you're observing on the outside, um, just I think we're going to have a nice day on Tuesday. Um, but sometimes you always, you know, it's New Hampshire, have your raincoat or some gloves and hats and mittens. Sometimes it can get cold um, <laughs> to be outside, especially in November. Um, so when, when we're outside, we're looking for any verbal harassment of voters, any threatening signs, anybody trying to block the entrance, any traffic issues. This did happen at a polling place. There was a traffic like a mile long backed up because there wasn't adequate parking in the parking lane. Um, people trying to electioneering. Um, if you see any of this intimidation, um, please go to the moderator first. The moderator is the person in charge of the polling place. Um, and the best way is you go inside and you say, may I speak to the moderator? And any of the polling um, 
poll workers will be able to direct you to the moderator. They kind of are that, um, the person kind of in charge. You can kind of tell when you walk in, like scan the room, who's in charge of all of the staff, who's, who's the person who everyone's asking questions of. Um, the moderator is the first person. And oftentimes because the moderator is doing their duties inside, the moderator is supposed to go outside. But I think you can just say, um, I believe there is intimidation um, happening outside and it would be good for you to, um, to do this. There, and then you would use that 1-800 number that I gave you to the attorney general's office. Um, the attorney general goes around every single polling places. There is a six page checklist that they are looking for when they go out. Um, and so to know what, what the attorney general is looking for is the proper signs up. Um, so um, is the moderator, you know, and, and we have some of these, um, you know, so you might want to download this polling place checklist so you know what those items are. Um, guns are allowed in New Hampshire polling places. So even if you're in a school that doesn't allow, um, guns are allowed in polling places. So those school rules are, are trumped by a, a law in New Hampshire that allows for guns to be carried in. Um, so if somebody, is carrying their gun and being threatened, if that's a different story, but if they're just have it on their hip and they're standing there, then they're allowed to stand in the polling place with their guns. Um, but this is also, we also have police officers at a lot of polling places too. Um, so they're the ones sort of watching out for, for these things. But if there's anyone who's being threatening or intimidating with their weapon, um, these are issues to report to the moderator first. Um, anyone who is threatening any harm, please just call 911 um, and then report those issues to the attorney general as well. Um, I, I put this up there. I hope no one has a militia at their polling place. I hope you never need to know that militias are not allowed into the polling place, but I wanted you to know that the, the law is really clear that there are no militia, militia, militia allowed. So if you see anyone who is part of any organized militia group who is part of a poll observer or watcher, um, they, shouldn't, they should not be allowed. So um, I hope you don't need to know this. <laughs> Um, what is the role of our local police that are at the polling place? Um, the polling, the police um, can um, be involved if someone is um, escalating. I think most of the time the police are just there to observe and make sure nothing goes wrong. So um, I have seen the, the local police, if there's activity outside, people being loud or rowdy, um, somebody showed up drunk once to a polling place and kind of fell over, like the police dealt with that problem. So um, we do have um, police officers in most polling places in, in throughout the state. So the question for you is, what do you do if you see a problem? So again, bring your problem to the moderator. The moderator is kind of the god or the rule, the, the rule. There is um, a handout that we'll send out afterwards that sort of gives you a little tip. Like if you see vo voting, voter suppression, um, like giving out the wrong, uh, the wrong polling place, like that's when you report it to us as election protection. Um, if you see um, other information, then you'll report that to the attorney general or the secretary of state. So we'll give you a little cheat sheet on that. Again, any violence or intimidation, you can call the um, call 911. Um, but you'd also want to raise those issues with the moderator as well. Um, so what we want, what happens after the election? Many recounts are likely to have happen after the election. 
Um, volunteers are needed to be at recounts. Observers are welcome to view recounts. Um, so it's also another job to happen after the September 13th primary. Voters have, uh, uh, candidates that request the recount have five days to request it after the election. We are gonna go to a video about how to report problems. Hopefully this works. Let's enter our name first. Then we're going to enter our polling place address. Here you can look up the address location by entering the name of the location you are at, such as a library, school, or you can click on the blue button, which will auto locate where you are in that exact moment, as long as you've enabled the JotForm app to be able to search where you are. Let's go ahead and make an incident report. Again, each state's programs vary, so this might not look exactly the same in your state. First, we'll want to enter the name of the voter who's experiencing an issue at the polls. Then we'll ask the voter if they would be willing to share their phone number so that we can follow up with them at a later time. to identify exactly what problem that voter is experiencing. Let's say Dr. Watson is having some problems with the technology at the polling place, and he's also a little bit nervous about the health and safety at his polling place. Dr. Watson also had some trouble with his voting machine, as well as when he was being checked in. He was generally worried about COVID-19, so we're gonna go ahead and put that in. Then you're gonna let your state team know whether or not Dr. Watson needs a follow-up call to make sure that his issue is resolved. Next, you'll be able to type in any details you'd like to include in this particular report. You'll then be prompted for an opportunity to upload audio or photo attachments. You'll be able to record an audio note here, either describing the incident or allowing the voter to testify themselves. Then you'll be prompted whether you'd like to upload or take a photo to accompany this report. Finally, you'll hit the submit button to ensure that your report goes to the state lead team. After submitting, your form will reload back to the start. Your state leads will contact you if any action needs taken or if they have follow-up questions. Thanks so much for staying tuned. And we'll make sure to send out the JOT form. The JOT form is just a tool for you to communicate with uh, Sarah, Doreen, and I. Um, on election day about any problems that could arise. So if you meet a voter who was discriminated against, um, you'll wanna collect their story. Um, if you meet somebody whose name wasn't on the checklist, um, in our state prim primary in New Hampshire, most of the voters problem was that they voted in a primary before and they forgot to change back to in in undeclared or uh, what they call an independent voter. And uh, they go and they get the ballot that they last voted in because they have to vote in the party primary that they're registered in. So on September 13th, most of the problems um, in the past have been around people who thought they were registered in a different party um, and weren't, weren't able to reconcile that and had to vote with the ballot that they had. So um, and it's important when you 
we encounter those voters, you know, that they can go to the Secretary of State's website ahead of an election and verify what part what party they're registered at. Um, Sarah, do you want to say anything more about using the JOT form or the questions? Um, yeah, just real quick. I put this in the chat also, so the link's in the chat if you want to take it from there. Um, but I'll send out this video and this link afterward. And this is a form you can use on a computer, tablet, or phone. So if you bring uh, if you bring your phone or tablet to the polling place, you can record these things in the moment or you can record them if you bring a pen and paper and then go home between going to other polls. You can also um, record these stories after the fact. So we're asking people to observe the polling place, um, sort of no notice any problems. I sometimes like to go check out my polling place in the morning maybe at lunchtime and kind of towards the end of the day. Um, or if you're gonna say, I'm gonna take all of the wards in my city um, and you're gonna to travel to all 12 wards in Manchester, you know, you're gonna roam around each ward or if you're gonna take polling places um, in the surrounding towns near you. So you can do more than one, you can observe more than one polling place and actually it gives you good insight on, you know, what's different between this polling place and, you know, like I can observe my polling place when I go and vote and then observe another polling place. So to, to sign up and um, sign up for a shift, we're gonna play this little video on how to sign up so we know which polling place you can observe. Um, so we don't have double observers on this in the same polling place because if Doreen's gonna observe Northwood, she'll have whoever signs up first kind of claims that polling place. So if Doreen signs up and grabs Northwood to observe, then um, you know you'd have to just grab Nottingham or um, Epsom or a different town around, um, so that you know, you know somebody's got this polling place covered. There's 309 polling places. Um, we will not have 309 volunteers for September uh, Tuesday, um, but we're going to see how many polling places we can get covered. I was shocked two years ago that we were able to get uh, a good uh, portion of polling places covered two years ago um, with a, a crew of volunteers. So this is how you sign up um, for your poll monitoring um, sign up shift. This video tutorial will show you how to volunteer at a polling place using the find your shift tool. Use the URL link your organizer gave you and place it on an internet tab. You should find yourself on this landing page. Make sure that the state listed above is that of your organizations. Type in the same email that you use to register for the training to log in. Once on this page, find the filter banner above to change the criteria of the shifts you want to sign up for. On the left, you can place the zip code of where you would like to volunteer the primary language of the polling place, the site type, the dates that you are available to volunteer, and the shift times. Click search. You will now see all of the polling places and shift times that match your criteria. Note that you can filter for different locations and times to register for another shift. You can also cancel a shift you've signed up for. Scroll down to see all of the available polling places and volunteer times. Select the polling place that you're interested in, the time that you're interested in, and sign up. You should receive an email confirmation with the volunteer shift that you are able to go to. And fingers crossed, this works and all the polling places are loaded, uh, but you might have to go to the Secretary of State's website and um, find a polling place. Um, so we hope this works uh, and that everything got loaded properly, but um, the data is not that great in our state. So you might have to do a secondary uh, lookup to find the address of your polling place. Sarah, do you wanna say more about that? Um, yeah, if anyone has trouble finding, using this tool or finding a polling place, feel free to email me and I'll put the uh, polling place search in the follow-up email as well. 
And we, when we did a survey of a bunch of town websites, we found that some of the town websites didn't have polling addresses. So um, it was a little bit problematic. So the Secretary of State does have a polling place lookup um, on the Secretary of State's pep page. So that's a, a backup, but hopefully everything worked and loaded and, and all of the New Hampshire polling places are loaded. Um, but our data uh, was only as good as the data we had to upload. So. Hopefully it all worked. Um, also, um, just my email and my cell phone number, um, Sarah's email um, and Doreen's email and cell phone number. Um, you can reach all of us um, on election day. Um, if you have other issues, you can call the 1-866-R-VOTE hotline all day long, um, as well as um, making sure everyone has the attorney general's phone number and the Secretary of State's phone number if you have uh, problems and you need, need either of them. Sarah, did you have anything else to add to this? Nope, that's all for me. Okay. I'm gonna stop share and ask, um, I covered a lot of New Hampshire rules pretty quickly, um, but I wanna leave space to have people ask questions about what they're looking for, or how to sign up. Yes, um, it's not Brian, it's Anne. Yeah, that's right, thank you. Um, I had two questions. The first one seems kind of dumb. I know you'll say there's no dumb question, right? How do we know, how do you identify a militia? I mean, I have a picture in my head, but you know, there are so many, um, there seem to be a lot of threatening people at, around the polls at some point in time. And how do you know if they're, organized or think of themselves as a militia? Is there a specific definition for that? And then my other question is, as an observer, do you have to have some identification or something to show when you get to the poll that you have a right to stand there and, and listen in? Thank you. Um, so I'll take the second question first, because it's easy. Uh, we do have a printable name tag that just says nonpartisan um, poll observer. If you don't have a a printer to print your name tag. Um, you can just write nonpartisan poll observer and put it on a sticker and to wear it. Um, and you also don't need to have identification. Um, any, any citizen can observe the polls in New Hampshire. It is allowable. I, um, your, your first question is, um, I'm gonna turn it over to the group. How would you go about identifying um, an armed militia. Doreen, how would you how would you identify them? Well, they're gonna have a gun, and probably they're probably gonna be wearing some sort of a insignia, um, a, a clothes, you know, t-shirt, camouflage, things like that. Um, and again, I put this up there to say, I hope it doesn't happen. So, um, I, you know, in 2020, we heard that there might be armed militias at polling places and we didn't see any of it. So I, I really do hope you do not see any, um, but, but yeah, they will be, um, yeah. And I think if you also can say these people seem intimidating. You can also ask the police officer inside the poll place to, to have a conversation with them. Thank you. But anyone who kind of looks like a vigilante and they, we have seen some of these groups marching before and, and they do kind of look like they have uniforms. Other questions? Um, so Brian, uh, uh, so Anne in the chat did say, um, felons can vote in New Hampshire. That is correct. Um, any, um, well, so anyone who is, sorry, convicted felons cannot vote. Uh, so if you're locked up on a felony charge, but once you leave jail, you're, voting rights are restored. Um, anybody awaiting trial 
or in jail on a misdemeanor is also allowed to vote. Um, there's been a new law passed this year so that they can get an absentee ballot from jail. Um, so New Hampshire does have, so convicted felons who are currently si serving time for their felony lose their right to vote during that time. Um, but anyone who's a convicted felon who is at your polling place, well, is 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 out on is out is out of jail. So, you know, they have gotten their right back. I am. Um, I do believe, uh, Sarah. Maybe in the follow up, we can send the ACLU's handout on convicted felons, so folks can understand the New Hampshire law and the new rules that went into effect this election that allowed felon felon uh, people in jail waiting trial. Um, or people in jail on a misdemeanor to um, get an absentee ballot. Any other questions? So uh, my question for you, um, Morton, are you able to Tuesday to go check out a polling place and which polling place do you can you might do you, are you thinking about um, <laughs> I'll have to think about it but we're in centipede you're in I centipede. don't know if you have anybody assigned to that or not but I don't um, think we have anyone assigned to centipede well, I guess it's a maybe <laughs> well at least when you go to centipede to to vote you can sort of make sure everything's running smoothly in no, this, yeah, I think this was very helpful very educational and yes, and, and knowing who to contact if you see a problem. So we will certainly be able to do that. Great. And um, yeah, we we also, you know, Sunapi, you know, if you're able to sort of check out Newport or or New London, you know, if you are able to sort of if you if you if you're free on Tuesday and want to sort of go check out a couple of polling places in your area, that would be great. Sure. I don't think Catherine signed up signed up for Sunapee. So if Catherine beats you to Sunapee, <laughs> we'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Andy? I'm going to sign off because I'm in Pennsylvania. So uh, the information was useful and I'll look forward to getting the same thing from PA. From Common Cause in thank Pennsylvania. You. Yes. Thank yep, you. Thank you. Um, and I, I love that Doreen said Concord has canceled their schools because they don't want guns in the polling place. Um, my city, Franklin, also cancels their schools because um, middle, the middle school is one of the polling places and the school administration don't want the kids in the building if guns are allowed in the, on the campus. So that's actually a common thing. Some schools don't do it, but some schools do who are concerned with safety. So. But our, our, our principal, I think, came to the council like eight years ago, before, you know, saying that they're concerned by that and they have a student. So yeah, there's no, there's no school in my city on um, for school. Um, what we actually found is that actually creates, you know, it's a double-edged sword, right? So now parents are scrambling for childcare and, um, so it is, it is kind of a, a double-edged sword because we want those parents to show up and vote. Um, some of them are able to take time off of work so that they're home with their kids, but, um, but that, is our, that is our law. Linda, have you ever noticed anything interesting in Antrim at your polling place? It's usually very quiet, really. Um, and yeah, it, and it seems to just go just the way it should. Um, yeah. I think just because we're a small town, we've never had to wait. Our moderator is very conscientious and on top of things. Um, so it's it's smoothly. I'm actually excited. Sarah knows, but I'll be working as a ballot clerk all day. So I'm, I'm really, I just found out this morning. So I'm really looking forward to that. Great. And I looked, I printed out <laughs> Ballot clerk instructions from the Secretary of State's manual. Training. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> yeah, so you know how to mark how to mark the ballot because it's, it's a tricky job. So I'm glad you were you're inside as a poll worker because uh, we do know there's a shortage of poll workers mm -hmm. this year in a lot of places, but seems like they're getting filled. Mm -hmm. um, I will say um, that there are two, three, three polling places this year um, that will have a monitor from the attorney general there all day. Um, so that's Wyndham, Bedford, and Laconia Ward 6. Um, those were polling places that there was issues in the last election. So the attorney general has appointed an, an attorney to be there all day to make sure everything runs smoothly. Um, so right now, those are the three places. Um, as I talked about the voter who was turned away by intimidation that happened in Wyndham um, a few years ago. So um, we, we have known that Wyndham has been an issue. Um, 